being the cord. So the two hours that we had on the 31st of August um, was where people started getting into the code and in, in a lot of specifics. Um, that was well attended. Um, a lot of it, I mean, almost all of the comments focused on um, the master plan development, which is any area that's over four, four acres or over. And there's certain ways that that appears in the code. And, People asked a lot of questions and we focused a lot on 99 Main across the street because there are some ideas. You know, there's a sketch for that. Um, it's just over four acres. So we spent kind of a lot of time on that. People you know, talked about the size of the MPD, the trigger size, what the streets might look like, um, cul-de-sacs, um, what else, open space types, and how those would be um, required, waivers, modifications in that. Um, and again, I think it is a process. And, and um, I think when, when we talk with, when we hear from Leslie, we will get that sense of like, what some of the developers see when they first read the code is they see, this is what I have to do. And they don't see and here are a series of options as ways to do it. So they're, they're you know, but they are getting into it and we are, um, you know, the, the process is a real conversation and some revisions are definitely gonna happen. It's just a matter of what and when. So I think um, there are even some questions about the map. I won't go through all the areas where there are questions, but um, I think we will get through those tonight and then open it up to your own questions. But I think Leslie has some remarks that will sort of help us get into the weeds. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, thank you very much for having us. Um, this is my first time speaking to you all and, and meeting you all. and. Um, Kirk Bishop with Duncan Associates is here as well. Um, I just want to do a very kind of quick presentation. Um, it's about 10 minutes um, just to kind of set the stage for the questions, um, because I think it's really important that we keep in mind, you know, kind of where the code is coming from and where we intend for the code to go. Um, so as you know, the Recode Topson project is two parts. Um, Kirk Bishop with Duncan Associates is uh, largely responsible for part one, the reorganization of chapter 225. Um, I don't know, Kirk, if you wanna say a brief introduction of yourself and, and what you've been working on, or if you've, where you're at, do you? You're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> Yeah, sure, Leslie. Uh, um, I'll add my uh, good evening to, to Leslie's as well. It's good to see you all. Um, you know, I guess I will say that um, my portion of this project is uh, generally focused on uh, kind of making, trying to make the remainder of Chapter 225, the zoning code, uh, a little more uh, user-friendly, easier to navigate, and then it involves some reorganization, some general editing, and then um, working with uh, the town planning staff, um, the code enforcement officer and the planning board, kind of infusing that overall draft with some new tools and revisions, some stemming from changes in state law and others just from uh, observations of existing practice. Um, to kind of modernize the code and, uh, and, and as I say, make it a, a little more user-friendly document that uh, positions the town well into the future for um, uh, uh, adequate and a competent review of development proposals and, and guiding future growth and development in the town. Um, but, as, um, but tonight's focus is going to be generally on the uh, Topsom Center area and um, I'll uh, hand the mic back to you, Leslie, and uh, and guide us through that portion. All right. So part two of the code is this really focus on new mixed use zones for Topsom Center. And these are some of the 
you know, project object objectives that we have to create a place out of Topsom Center based on the comprehensive plan updated design standards, um, including some sustainable development practices. Um, but I sort of asterisk streamlining development review and approval procedures because right now you have a fairly discretionary site plan review process um, that we wanna try and make a little bit more objective and make it easier for a developer to do kind of the right thing. Um, and that's part of why we're trying so hard to make sure that this new code is meeting all of the goals and objectives for the area, but also that the developers think that it's a good tool and, and um, understand what you know the purpose of it is. So as um, Susan was saying, we are in phase, we're just sort of entering phase three. We've had a couple of developer um, focus group meetings um, just because we felt like they were a really important uh, group to make sure that we're getting this right. Um, we are anticipating a third developer meeting because we kind of ran out of time at the office hours meeting that Susan was just talking about. Um, we also will have a couple more CPIC meetings to talk about the results of those uh, developer focus groups and a planning board meeting on, I believe it's October 3rd. And the idea behind all of that is that we're going to take this, what was the sort of initial draft that you see here in phase two in green that was largely internal um, and, you know, get it ready to, you know, pull out to the public, show the public what we've been working on and kind of putting our best foot forward. Um, we anticipate a public open house meeting at the end of October um, or this fall at some point, assuming that we can make sure that we've got all those tweaks and revisions done um, appropriately. Um, oops. Uh, so I just wanna Briefly go back to the comprehensive plan because I think it's really important that we keep doing that, going back to the comprehensive plan, which is a really was a really wonderful process and produced a wonderful document that I think everybody feels a lot of ownership in. Um, and the idea of this comprehensive plan um, was to really focus intentional growth within the Topsom Center area. Um, with a lot more sort of compact walkable development. Um, from that, there were catalyst sites that were identified. Um, these four were sort of um, conceptual, produced, the team produced some conceptual illustrations for. Um, and in my world, these illustrations tell us a lot. Um, again, they're conceptual, but they're very important to conveying some of the concepts that were in the plan and indeed the community saw these illustrations um, and you know bought into it um, and that's why the plan was adopted. Um, within the plan there are these wonderful illustrations, these um, three-dimensional drawings that again I realize are very conceptual and were meant to convey the ideas behind it but I just want to kind of point out some of the aspects of these. So this is um, the illustrative drawing for the upper village and you can see that this is highlighting buildings that are built up to the sidewalk with wide streetscapes, multi-use buildings with ground floor storefronts um, and upper floor uses. So mixed use, multi-story buildings, um, the idea that people are sort of gathering and that social interaction, which is one of the goals of the plan is created along these streetscapes um, that we have a high level of permeability between what's going on within the buildings and what's happening on the sidewalk. So you see that there's the potential for lots of activities happening in this area. Um, and looking at the lower village, this illustration was for a little redevelopment site, um, which I know, you know might change obviously, but some of the ideas that are conveyed in this concept are you know, publicly accessible open space that's, you know, visually available. You can see it as you're driving by. You can stop and park and get out and go into it. Um, it's creating uh, more green space and, you know, more, just generally more green within the community and within the area. The buildings, again, um, are highlighting a more sort of village feel to them with the pitched roofs. The scale of the buildings is fairly narrow. These are not gigantic, long, mixed use buildings like you might see in Portland or other places. Um, there's uh, multifamily housing, multi-unit housing that's made to look like 
village type houses. So these tell us a lot of the kind of concepts that people were seeing and liking during that process. And finally, just looking at the Crooker District illustration, um, what we see here are streets and blocks introduced into this large site um, where, again, the open space is uh, available and you know uh, immediately visible um, as you enter the site. Uh, the buildings are built close to the sidewalk, but there are other types of open space like a plaza area along with a green, um, parking is behind the buildings. And again, the buildings relate to the streetscape. And there's a lot of streetscape provided, sidewalks, continuous sidewalks everywhere. Um, these are all great concepts um, for increasing walkability, having great socially active places, um, which are all goals of the plan. The plan also called for uh, trying to use form-based zoning um, as opposed to conventional zoning. And your zoning code is not wholly conventional zoning. Um, you have a lot of design standards um, associated with that site design process. Um, but form-based zoning is, again, just another kind of zoning. It is typically used for these kinds of places, um, like the plan is calling for, mixed-use places with a high-quality public realm, so the buildings relating to um, the street and most of the regulations associated with that interaction between the street and the building. But perhaps most importantly, it's all about creating objective metrics um, that staff can review and improve um, without a whole lot of negotiation going on and discretionary um, uh, review of these kind of soft statements that are in the site plan process. And that means that the results from the code will be much more predictable. And it means that the process can be much more streamlined because a developer will not be coming in and spending those fees again and again, redesigning based on how those design standards are interpreted. So that's the goal of what we're trying to create um, is a set of predictable standards um, that will make it easier for developers to do um, good development. So super quick, I, I know you've seen the recording um, of the code, but this is chapter 225's contents, table of contents. I, it, I believe it's still accurate, um, but I just wanna highlight article two is all about the new Topsom Center zones. Um, article six is about uses for the town as a whole. Um, so the Topsom Center zones are located and their uses that are allowed are located in that article. Drive-throughs and other accessory structures in article seven, building design that's specific to the Topsom Center zones is in article eight. But I really wanna talk a little bit today about article two, just in relationship to um, what we saw in the comprehensive plan. Um, you've seen this map. Um, and these are the areas that um, we're focusing on. Um, we've created seven districts. Um, these districts are really contextual. They are all about these different character areas. Um, and you can see that we've split Topsom Fair Mall into two zones because Park Drive is a much different area than Topsom Fair Mall um, Road. And so we wanted to really relate to that. We've kept the lower village, middle village, and upper village designations pretty much as they are, but the regulations will be different. Um, and then, of course, the Crooker District has its own zone, um, and the annex is all about um, housing, different housing types. Um, we have heard from uh, people that I think Susan will, will uh, relay to you that there are other locations where people are asking for um, the code, but at this point, we're just looking at these particular areas. So for each one of those seven zones, um, there are regulations for setbacks, just like you have in your current code, um, a series of setbacks for the front and the side and the interior side and the rear setback, as well as site coverage. What makes this unique is that we have um, these sort of zones along the street, minimum and maximum setbacks so that the buildings are located close to the street, just like is illustrated in all of those conceptual plans. All of the buildings are intended to be located adjacent to a street or an open space. So we've allowed for these sort of groupings of buildings 
um, to be located around an open space and built within that. Um, the idea is to kind of control how those buildings are relating to where people are going to be walking. So everybody will be able to walk kind of along the fronts of buildings, um, even if it's not just continuous along a street. The second set of regulations is all about building types. So the zone regulations define where the buildings can go on the site for e within each zone. And then for each one of the different building types, there's a set of regulations for sort of their facades and their building form, the scale of those buildings. Um, and this is what one set of regulations for a building type looks like. Um, so what we're doing is we're really focusing on making sure that the buildings are of the right width and scale um, and that they're broken up into multiple pieces. And then again, as I was mentioning in the comprehensive plan, that we're uh, looking at what the windows and doors look like on the street. So we're regulating how many, like a minimum amount of windows to make sure that those buildings have that permeability for people that are walking along them. So street facades, windows, and doors. Oops. Um, and so the last thing that you haven't seen yet that um, Susan was referring to, unless you've really dove into the code, which I don't know, I don't know if you've had time to, but this master plan development is a tool that was created to apply to these larger sites like the Crooker District, um, but also smaller areas that are four acres or more. Um, and there are several of those um, in, in the top, Thompson Center. We are looking at whether or not that four acres is the right size, um, but even if it is the right size, we will be looking at tailoring the, reg the regulations a little bit more to smaller MPDs and larger MPDs and giving a little bit more flexibility to some of those regulations probably. Um, the MPD is all about introducing streets and blocks. So you've got these really large parcels and we wanna make sure that the buildings that are located along streets, that new streets can be developed within. And so this is just the type of diagram that a developer would have to create at that level um, to show where new streets would go, to show where open space might go within a larger site and to show how you might have a mix of building types within those sites. So again, this is a tool that we've created specifically for those larger sites and to help guide how they're divided up. Um, what we're anticipating is that um, there would be waivers available to go to planning board to ask for ways to get relief from uh, some of the regulations, but we wanna be very careful about that so we're not sort of opening up a can of worms. Uh, some of the developers expressed concern that they didn't wanna go to the planning board because they were gonna, afraid that the buildings would then have to be a particular color based on the planning board review. And so we wanna be sort of careful about how we're wording those waivers and that's something that we're working on um, in this interim time as well. Um, so that's just a little bit of a nutshell. And I didn't hit on all of the, the comments that we received, but I expect that Susan will bring some of those up. Again, just to say that we anticipate another developer meeting um, and to have more conversations with CPIC about these rev uh, revisions. And I will say that that second developer meeting was really helpful. People really got down and looked at the words that were on the page and we talked about how they were being interpreted and whether or not we could change some of that wording, but also to look at how the different options are laid out. And I think that there was a lot more clarity at the end of that meeting um, based on some of the comments that we received, so. I mean, one example of that that might be helpful is, you know, the Crooker site is like, 52 acres, 54 acres, something like that. And who knows how that's gonna be developed, whether it's like a 10 acre parcel or three, four, you know, equal parcels. But what the MPD calls for is for the developer to take that parcel and kind of sketch out what's gonna go where. Where will the streets be? Where will the open space be? where will be you know certain buildings and some general things about building types and there was a lot of pushback by the developers and then the conversation as we got into like what's really the problem leslie clarified we're not talking about any engineering here 
we're talking about really um, a general layout so that the process can begin. And it's it's not like it's, I mean, it, they will be held to it, but there will be ways for it to be modified. If plans end up changing, there will be ways for modifications to happen. And, and that part of the process with an MPD is not meant to be hugely expensive or time consuming. So it, it's not that engineering piece. It's like, what's your big intention here so that we can see how that parcel is gonna um, abut the next parcel? Where are the streets gonna go through that large area um, so that we can, we, you <laughs> can figure out, you know, sort of how that whole piece is gonna work together. Um, and and I could you could feel a sigh of relief you can go through, you know, the the folks who were there because they had a whole different idea about what was what was being demanded of them, you know, at that early stage. And they said, Oh, well, we can do that, you know. So it's clear that we need another round of conversations, but we it also felt we walked away from there thinking. We are getting somewhere. There is a meeting of the minds. Um, where do people find that? What do you mean? That office hours meeting. It was posted. It was posted. We didn't record that meeting. We took minutes of the meeting, um, and they will be approved at the next secret meeting. So then I'll post those. Because you've limited talk time at regular meetings where people can watch and see to now have these office hours. So if people can't go back and review what you say is enlightening, that doesn't really offer the person watching from outside any ability to see that. No, that one meeting, right. they, they haven't given the ability to see, but all of the CPEC meetings are recorded. And the last CPIC meeting, which was the, so we had the um, the stakeholder workshop was the 18th of July. And then our regular CPIC meeting was well attended by developers. I think about four or five people came with questions. And we, I don't know how much time was given on the agenda, but it was considerable. It wasn't the 10 minutes, it was probably 40 minutes of our agenda was given over to that. And it was during that come back and forth where we said, let's do something even more specific so that we can actually- I'm just picturing us. the more stuff like that happens, because yeah. 40 minutes and four showed up as 10 minutes apiece. Um, this is all gonna try to happen on one night in May. And the overwhelming majority of people will never have looked at any of this. So, if you're not, if you can't, you know, have that available for those that might be able to help answer questions, you're you're harming the process. So having, you know, having these office hours, I get why you did it, but you've also limited what people can see, read, hear, because notes are not the same as video. Right. I, I just, this is going to be a long May night. We are putting together a, a document too of, of questions that have come up at our workshops, yeah. um, the development meetings, and um, and you know giving answers answers to those questions. We're going to have that all online as well. So, in addition to this workshop with you, there's going to be an October third workshop, same subject matter with the planning board. That's open. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I'm assuming that if people are interested in this, um, they will <clears throat> tune into those things. I've been to enough town meetings to know how much people prepare ahead of time and how much they don't. And um, yeah. This is I, an awful lot of change for one night. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> so one of the one of the directions well, we've talked about a couple of times. May's coming up quick. You know, there's a lot that needs to happen between now and January mm. to get this going. We've got the holidays in, but you know, having everything documented at every time, very similar to how we did neighborhood meets. 
Um, that, I think that kind of detail is, is what's been talked about. Um, continuing until every comment's been addressed, uh, whether it be a compromise, different answer, whatever, it, that there has to be to talk back and forth. So this won't be brought forward to the board unless all of that has happened and we have that kind of outreach. I have had that concern of days only because people are so uninformed. And a lot of people choose to be uninformed. And this is a big project. It's a, it's I really like the village concept. I like the buildings and stuff like that. Some things I'm gonna ask you questions about later, but I do like that part of it. But um time I've been with the town for two eons. And uh, since 1984, I've been part of the process, not necessarily working for the town, but part of the process. And people choose not to be informed. They'll say, we didn't know there was a meeting. Well, you got a flyer that's been advertised for a whole year. You set the agenda a year ahead of time. We talk about it. We tell people that same thing's gonna happen with this unless you get your message out and you have to find a venue to do that. Mm -hmm. And it is it isn't just meetings or recordings, it's gotta be visible. It's gotta be so people can see what you're talking about because this is nice what you're talking about. Most of it is real nice, some of it I disagree with, but, but unless you explain it, explain costs and how it's really, all of it's going to impact the town, it's going to be difficult, like basis. Well, one of the things <laughs> we thought was, is in terms of, you know, modeling the open house on the way we had a public meeting mm -hmm. at the library during the update process. I've run into people years later who still talk about how sure. wonderful that was. Yeah. Now, you know, this is a different part of the process, but so we've booked the library, for sort of a, a noon to three with a couple hours of setup in the morning to have a similar kind of thing. But whether or not that date works, we'll see, but it looks like it could work on October 28th. That's a Saturday. What's the best day and time to get everybody? Who knows? But I did find out that that's the last game or match or the soccer season. <laughs> We've tried to, you know, find that spot, the sweet spot. And um, it, it, the library seems like a place that people are comfortable with. Um, you know, it will offer lots of display area. The, uh, the technology will be good, um, whether people come in person or, um, you know, come remotely. I, I think coming in person will, will work best for people because they'll see and hear you know, and, and be able to talk with each other like they did during the update process. So, I mean, that's some of the stuff ahead. Um, I have some other questions. Should I go? Or? Oh, I don't. I just, I don't know where they are. In yeah. there. I just hit off of what they just talked about. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I think we've introduced enough that I can say more about the developers, but I think it's time, you know, we'd like to hear from you in terms of if you've had a chance to actually dive into the code and have questions. You said you'd like some of it, you don't like some of it. Well, I didn't really no. say I don't like some of it. Mm -hmm. I, there's other pieces of it that's yeah. got to fit, and sure. that's what, to me, is unanswered. Um, I love the concept of walk-in area in the village and things like that, and I've always liked the concept of like, the downtown where the river is and things like that, be able to walk from here to there and not necessarily expensive sites, sidewalks, like we saw something one time with crushed stone or something like that, just pathways. So people can walk and have a sense and have little shops and boutiques. I think that's a great idea. What I'm concerned about is, as always, is um, costs and costs meaning housing. Housing is very, very expensive. We don't have enough in the state. I don't care whether you're in Washington County or here. And the more impact we put on this, like the more permits from the town, from the state, from us, and the more, it just adds to that cost. So it's not just um, 
the affordable housing, there's many factors. It's not just one factor. It isn't just uh, supply and demand. It's the cost to produce the product. And people don't talk about that. And that's what I'm concerned about. The storefronts, I think, are great. I, I think that's to walk by them and help the merchants and help things like that. I think that's wonderful. That's what I'm concerned about. All this, uh, and I'm for green space, but I think it has to be limited because all that adds on to the development costs. And I'm not a developer, <laughs> but these are things that I'm concerned about for the town. I guess before, so my question I have, because if there isn't an answer for it, I don't know as we need to go on. So this document, it's a working document. I know there's going to be feedback that could be changes. Probably not a lot. This is probably what's going forward in reality. So we show up, town meeting, let's say it's passed. Thursday morning, Julie comes into work at 8.30. Here's a new code in front of you. Crooker never moves. What's the contingency plan for what we passed that night? Copy my question. Negative Batman. Writing it down. Like, you just did. Uh, <laughs> you looked at us. <laughs> so what's that contingency plan look like? If Crooker never moves, because there isn't a part of me right now that believes they're moving. That believes they're not moving. I don't believe they're moving. As we've been here six years, ever since everyone got excited about the silos down at the fire station. <laughs> they didn't Crookers, see that picture, they? Crookers has driven the comp plan process. It has driven the CPEX process. They're still where they are. There's nothing in line for them to move. What happens? What's our plan? That passes. And Crooker never moves. Because if if we don't have a plan and that's our new code, I don't see a need I need to be here the rest of the night, quite frankly, because that unless unless there's a plan that that goes away if Crooker doesn't move. It affects a lot more, Dave, than the Crooker district. I mean, we're looking at lower village. Middle village. But that's not what we're, village. we're not passing one yeah. at a time. You're going to come no, in and ask that's for right. that's one right. code. Yeah. And if that Thursday morning, that's our new code and Crooker never moves, what is the contingency plan? You're talking about grandfather. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. all of the buildings that are not in compliance with this code, none of them go away. Correct. It's, it, but if they want to do anything new. Right. Or they sell their business and it wants to continue to be used. Mm -hmm. Now you've limited. Now you've taken a very profitable taxpayer in this town, and you've made so much limitation by getting something in place that doesn't exist today. So, like, if Kirk so wanted to put a new building in that we were talking yeah. about, last week. yeah, what happened? I mean, are they frozen in time? Maybe yes. It looks like Kirk or Leslie. I mean, with I, the only thing I would say I, um, is, I I hear you, Dave, in terms of, um, and and I hear you in a way that wasn't apparent to me, in terms of, you know, I moved into town in 2014, and the extent to which Crooker has had an influence on things, you know, is bigger than I'm aware of. But I knew when we started, I mean, Matt and I were on the comp plan update committee. And, and you guys didn't want to, you didn't tackle it because it was too much to go. I mean, you've made some comments. And it was the right move. Well, and they, because but, they made an announcement. Right. That's what they want to do. And so we acted accordingly. And at one of your last meetings, he said, I'm not moving, right? Well, not, not quite, <laughs> but, but close. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's get an answer. What happens? Are they frozen in time? And I'm wondering if, I mean, this is, it is a big part. It's a big chunk. Um, have you run into something like this before, <laughs> Leslie and Kirk? Of course. Yeah. I mean, Kirk, do you want to talk about the non-conforming? Do you know? Was that something that you're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> He never does that. It's I, always me. I am. I'm. I'm a boomer. Um, 
I wouldn't describe it as frozen in time. They would have legal nonconforming status like any um, like any nonconforming situation. Um, uh, they'd be able to, you know, maintain, continue operations, sell the property. Um, there would be limits on their ability to expand um, or to intensify their operation, at least um, uh, their their ability to do that as of right. Um, expansions, enlargements, additions of new structures would require some form of relief, probably through the Board of Appeals through a variance process. Um, so um, that is the that would be the status if this code were adopted um, and someone came in at 8.30 on that Thursday morning, as you describe it. I guess we could um, attempt to anticipate or even modify the non-conforming provisions to provide some degree of flexibility for um, the eventuality that that Crooker doesn't move. Um, but as it stands now, they would have, you know, again, rights to continue and limited rights to expand. Um, the ability to make significant changes would require some form of relief through a process. Um, but those processes do exist um, under both today's code and the, uh, the the proposed new code. The changes we're making to the overall code structure don't significantly change the legal non-conforming provisions of the existing zoning code. But that's not to say we couldn't build in some additional flexibility for uh, you know specialized circumstances or to include that within the Crooker District uh, zoning per se. When you when you say build it in, that's ready to go built in prior to Mays Town meeting, or is that? I guess I'm. We, or, or would we deal with it after the fact? I no, I'm holding out the prospect that we could um, build in to the draft that goes to town meeting in May some some additional flexibility that's not currently contemplated because we've been. Um, so our working assumption has been that 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 deal will get done at some point. But if if there's a you know uh, increased pessimism that it is, then it you know may be appropriate to try and come up with a um, an alternative option for continued use of the site for um, you know in, in more in line with what's occurring there now. I'm holding that out in concept. I don't. I don't have specifics to share with you, but I think it's something we could we could certainly look at. And either, as as I say, build it into the Topsom Center zone, per se, or address it within the non-conforming article, uh, Article 14 of the proposed new code. Would you? Well, if uh, am I, go if ahead. If you want non-conforming, there business would be more it would be more restrictive for them to do business in the lot that they've been their entire time than it is today is that accurate and that that's where i'm going to this thing is what kind of impact assessments being done prior to putting this stuff on paper you, you have some idea of the parties that are in this zone that you're looking to change what's the impact going to be to them and that to me seems like it might cost some money to do that, but I think it's essential you get at least an idea of what the, the absolute is. And like today's point, you, you make a change, and all of a sudden this this business says, "I'm I'm out here." We we and it's no different that. than what we've done. I think the car dealerships are automatically non-conforming. So here's businesses that have been here since before we had codes, mm -hmm. been great businesses. And we've made them non-conforming, and now, and now we force them to undergo a whole nother process that never had to be based on ideology. Well, based on a vision as expressed in the a plan that was developed, um, you know, with sort of community-wide participation, um, it's not our it's not our intention or goal as this project to make it difficult for uh, existing property owners to. Um, do what they are, you know, make reasonable use of their property. But we were charged with giving you a set of zoning tools that would, you know, help fully realize the the comprehensive plan. 
Um, as and I say, I just, if, if, that's, if that's a concern, then I think we could, you know, I want to hold out the prospect that we could, you know, build in some flexibility that we didn't heretofore see that we perhaps needed based on the desire expressed in the plan. Right. And, and I will say it. I've said it numerous times over the years. Never to you. You've never heard it. I understand. I do not hold the comp plan as the Bible. Mm -hmm. It is simply that. It is a possible roadmap. It is a plan. If we don't do any of it, there's no harm in that either. So comp plan, if it doesn't work, so using that one item to rebuild this stuff, it it's never fits with how I've ever believed the comp plan to be. If, if the comp plan is going to harm people that have been here, businesses that have been here, based on new thoughts and ideas, I take issue and and so that's just my opinion. And I understand what you were given for directives. Um, but those are those are the things that I'm concerned with with this is the amount of places we're making non-conforming, the amount of things that we are dictating that you must have this much glass, that you must be set this way, trash has to be over here. You've got to give the public a piece of land. I, I just I have I those are very hard, very hard swallows for me. And then the crooker thing. I mean, we pass this with this crooker thing. I, I, it won't pass. One, if if crookers here and, and there's a possibility that they have to jump through hoops, they have a lot of support in town. A lot of people believe in it. There's a lot of jobs tied to them. Um it, that's I'm I'm really concerned with we've put so much effort into something that doesn't exist at this moment. We they've come before us multiple times and it never goes anywhere. So for me, from my chair, I question is it ever gonna happen? This has been years now. And you know, knowing what it was said at the last meeting, one of the last meetings, he wasn't happy. You know, I, I've heard of this. Things make their way out and about. Um, it's a very real possibility. And if it hadn't been thought about until right now, that, that... We haven't heard from them at all that they were concerned about their their lot becoming non-conforming. Not at all. So I I guess and I that, I've never heard but my question is if they don't ever go anywhere and mm -hmm. their job is now more difficult mm -hmm. and throwing stuff at the wall here so we've got non-conforming use let's say we have an empty lot right um, when that gets purchased and someone goes to build a brand new building there conforms to whatever's in here if it's an existing building the owner doesn't have to do a darn thing. Um, even if they put like a new shed up or something like that on their property until the property changes hands. And then this would come into play. No, yeah. it should we dictate. Well, you, you know, when I mean. there's a building permit, that, yeah, exactly. that triggers. Because I, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I totally hear the concerns of Crooker. I mean, they are a huge taxpayer in town. They provide a lot of jobs. I know with my building in Bath, I'd be pretty pissed off if the town the city came in and told me like, I can't put a storage building on my lot unless it meets these particular forms, unless that was part of the process, because then I can understand. Um, but, and understandably, Crooker has been sort of following this to a certain degree. Um, but it just seems to me like there's a potential here for keeping this intact, but with some kind of grandfathering, and Kirk, you had mentioned, um, you know, some sort of remedy or flexibility in uh, deliberating. I still think that's somewhat of a burden on the business I mean, if there's just a way to have in the code up front that, like, if you're, I really don't want to call it specific businesses because that's a little crazy. Um, but I mean, if you're an existing business that's been here for a very long time, in general, writ large, um, no, sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to put time limits on it either because that would be discriminating. Uh, so I guess I'll go back to my original point: building permit with a new owner this would come into play. Um, but absent that change of hands, 
we're not going to require like Leon to do something with his building or just throwing again throwing stuff at the wall. Thoughts. The buildings that are here yep. are gonna be the businesses that are here and the residences that are here yep. will be grandfathered in. All right, yeah, I understand that. So if he wants to put like a new building or something. Carport. Carport. No, I, honestly, but that's what Matt would when you were saying that, I was mm -hmm. thinking Crooker needs a new building storage facility. You know, salt's gotta be covered in a different way, or you need salt. more room, more room for trucks or that's that's a building permit yeah. whether it's ever changed ownership or not and this is theoretical i'm just curious when crooker over the past five years has built something new on I, have no, site. I, I don't know i don't know either but i have a feeling they haven't done much new building and much or none i don't know are right. we worried about that are we are we gonna i am worried because i'm worried that we are passing something that doesn't exist Maybe you're missing that but, point. It does not exist today. There is no crooked district. We've there said a lot no of things vision. tonight. We've said, and, and we're not, we're not done. But one of the things that we said is that, I, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, that whether or not anything gets done that's in the comp plan vision is of not really concern of yours, right? It it, it can be a roadmap if it works if it for works. the town, right? And that that comp plan had, as I understand it, more participation in the shaping of that plan than any previous plan that's ever been done. So a lot of people turned out and gave their opinions about a lot of things, and those things are reflected in the plan. Now, it's it's not a roadmap in terms of all the specifics, but it is a vision. And one of the things that we thought would be useful in helping the town move toward that vision is changing the land use code so that over time, I mean, we know that it takes, it takes a long time in terms of development um, before you start to actually see the change. I mean, some people remember when there was a gas station down on our side of the bridge, right? Not there. It Real. looks nice now, right? Okay, Real. right, right. And so, but you know, twenty-five years later, it looks very different down there. And so, what we're, I think, what we're trying to do is think how, in the next decade or two or three, you know, I won't see it, but you know, how this is going to shape the town. And Come the on, question Susan, of does it work or positive. not? Does does it work or not? You know. A lot of things have unintended consequences. This, I think, could have unenvisioned benefits. I would just suggest that people look at the possible benefits alongside the worries. Your argument works in the other areas of this, <laughs> that it's going to take 20, 25 years. Again, we don't have anything concrete in front of us. Right that Crookers is going anywhere. It's been, it's every time it's come forward, it's disappeared. And this has been multiple times over these right. years. I hear you. Um, you know, that that's, I understand it's gonna take a while to change things at the mall. This new building out here, it took a long time for a new building of this type <laughs> to be put. Are you talking about Aroma Jones? Yes, that magnitude. To be put here, but that came from the last comp plan, right? That was. That was the layout, how we got our planning. We we adjusted things. And it finally happened. And I have never heard worse feedback from people about a building in this right. town yeah. than that Me too. there. Um, and because you're right, it, it could be forever, forever in some of these areas before we see it. Um, I just as we start restricting people who have been here, you know, Lee Toyota. I mean, let's say Lee Nissan, he needs a facelift. Now he's in this new plan because he's non-conforming. He has to come in and jump through a whole separate set of hoops where we've tried to make things easier and people have answers, but non-conforming people do not have that. They're now subject to an appeal by a board of, hopefully they agree with what their vision is. I would just know that if we had form-based codes in place, that Aroma Joe's would probably look a lot better. 
than it does now. And there's that again. so there <laughs> so there's part of this, I'm glad because I think there's been a tremendous opportunity missed in this. Um, the work that Kirk's doing rewriting our current code couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. It needs to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. It needs you know you he probably can do a lot of things with charting and I, that's what I'm imagining he's coming forward with. But we've wrapped that into the passage of this. And that I think was a great opportunity lost that we didn't take time at first. Understand there's always gonna be changes. There's always gonna be changes to codes that if we could have cleaned up our code, just it, but now we've wrapped it into you have, you have to choose this or nothing. All of it wrapped together. And that I think was a great opportunity lost by going to what we're doing here now. It's like the National Defense Bill, right? <laughs> All or nothing. It's right. So I, for three months, and then we'll... I agree it. with the, as far as Broker. <laughs> Broker does have an impact on this town, but rightfully so. They have spent a lot of money in this town. They have helped the town for years and years. When our mills went out, Broker was there. They expanded, and they spent a lot of money in taxes. And that's important, it's very important. And I just feel, I agree with Dave, I I would advocate against it actually uh, for town meeting. I would talk to people, I would, because I think it's wrong to limit them. And I don't think, I think there's been an attitude against Crooker because they want to go out in River Road because they want to do this. And I think a, an attitude has been, been uh, developed because of, of people think they have power and they think that and i just think there's a lot of money to this town you pull that out your taxes are and, you know we're we're we're, we're, we're talking about some things that are a little bit theoretical yes I know. and i think it would be helpful to this process, because we are in a process, we've made some choices. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would only say, in response to some of the things both you, Ruth, and Dave are saying about Crooker, I'm no, I, I have no doubt that there are a lot of people in the town who that Crooker has a lot of support. I think there was a really crucial moment when a lot of people came and spoke out against an idea and there were no people speaking on behalf of Crooker. And I, I hope that that, you know, I don't know the impact of that moment at a select board meeting. I don't know. <clears throat> as far as I know, and as far as we know, you know, in terms of uh, a member of our committee um, has indicated in no way that that project is off the table. So I'm how come your theoretical is allowed and ours isn't? Because you're operating on theoretical now, but you don't want us to operate on theoretics. We we can consider, Dave. We can we can hear about. I heard Kirk say we can build certain things in, if you'd like. Well, can we talk about that? If Kirker was satisfied with what we're putting forward, would you then feel comfortable with it? For example, if they needed to build a new building, if they needed to make some changes in their operation, you know, they may decide in a year and a half, two years to move, or they may say, no, we're not moving. But, but if they but, happen in two years, then they sell. The next person is saddled with that, correct? In terms of buying the business yeah. and staying They in. can utilize the business the way it's been and, utilized. Yes, and otherwise jump. Mm -hmm. Again, I... And there, there are provisions that... Kirk said there are a couple of ways to go. Are you interested in that? I think we got to see him. I, I I think we have to see him, and I think they could possibly work. Um, I like where he was going down the road, and he'd, he'd have to think it out. But Crookers is here, you know. Maybe what it, maybe it was Matt. Whatever it takes for them to maintain their business, yeah. they can reside. And you probably can't. You can't probably say they can fall under the grandfather code, but. Um, yeah, I, I just think when you, I, I don't support what's here now. I mean, so. the goal is not to hurt businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, businesses that are here are here. 
Um, and we're only dealing with the Crooker site as in this plan because they publicly made an announcement. We, you know, and, and like you said, they haven't moved, I hear you. And so we can make some provisions perhaps in terms of if they don't move, what happens, you know, some relief. Why wouldn't it just be pulled aside until there's actual movement? This is just coming to another town meeting. I agree. There was some feedback at the developer meeting that they thought there's certainly details in here that are like they wanted more attention to drive throughs or more ability. And they talked about more fuel pump, some of that stuff. But they also said, we'd like the opportunity to have this in the quadrant um, on the other side of the highway. <laughs> Any thoughts on whether you think maybe we leave the Crooker district out and we for now and then we try to include. Thompson Fair Mall area, you have the districts, and then go across the highway, or do you think that would have a lot of political opposition? To it? It's always has in the past. I've never understood why. Um, that was a long time ago, too, at this point. But as long as it doesn't put the town on the hook to extend water sewer, you know, that's a developer issue in my eyes. Um, that's not a taxpayer issue. But And at this point, any existing business, if they want to, um, expand or anything and they meet codes presently to have them go to a board of appeals and stuff i just can't buy into that right now because they're here and they, they've complied to the rules now and for that it's costly it's time consuming some come with lawyers some come with and that's what i don't want to see um but I also, I hear you folks, and I think you've done good work, and there's many parts of it I do like. That, those parts, I don't, <laughs> just to be honest with you. But I think there are some things to be heard here, so about that. So thanks for putting that on. Yeah. Good question. I just, I just want to say. Thank you, oh, time. Just, oh, sorry, yeah. I was coming from this, like, yeah. it goes to here. In terms of rooms. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to say that this code was written with there's an existing section in your existing code 225-14 that Kirk was referring to called non-conforming uses, structures, and lots of records that allows no matter no matter what the exist the code says that those can continue. Um, it does have some language and they usually do about how enlargements are handled. It allows for maintenance. So repainting a facade or redoing a facade is allowed um, per that section as it's currently written. I think what Kirk is talking about is, and I've seen this, we've done this in many of our projects, is that you set that enlargements to, you know, 50% of the existing footprint or something like that, so that there is a reasonable amount of expansion that they can do um, without sort of throwing out the current code, because if you, you know, it, it's not tied to ownership at all. It's just tied to the parcel. And if you allow them to continue to expand, you will never see any change. You will never see anything, you know, meet that vision, but we can do something in between, you know, if it says no enlargements at all right now, and, you know, the other end of the spectrum is to allow them to do whatever they want based on the current code, which defeats the purpose of writing this code right now, um, then you know there's something in between that we can certainly look at and figure out um, and talk to you know property owners about as well. I don't know if that helped or um, but but the whole crooker thing, we have some other options. We just need to think them through and bring them to you um, to discuss. Let's see kick first. Anything more on that, Kirk, before we yeah, I think that's the key point for me is um, I, I'm hearing for the first time significant concerns about the effect of um, these new code provisions, particularly in the Thompson Center area, on uh, existing uses that would be rendered non-conforming, existing buildings that would be rendered non-conforming. There are a range of options uh, for addressing that in a in a more proactive way and i'm i'm thankful that we're hearing this now because this gives us time to think that through i think we do want to the opportunity to sit down with cpic 
and the uh, town staff and kind of go through those options and pre be prepared to present them to you and, and others as, as we move forward. And those options, you know, range from, Mark mentioned the idea of taking Crooker out. I mean, that's that's kind of a, uh, I would say that's at one end of the spectrum, making uses like car lots or car sales facilities uh, permitted uh, if they are in existence on the effective date so that they don't become non-conforming uses. Leslie's idea, which I think is reasonable about expanding the flexibility for existing non-conformities, whether they're uses per se or buildings, to expand and change um, in, a, in a more liberal way than is currently the case, that's another option. So um, we'd be prepared and 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 welcome the opportunity to kind of think through those options and come back to you um, with uh, with some proposals for how we might better deal with that. Because it's really the first time that we're hearing such a significant emphasis on this point. It's a completely legitimate point. Always reasonable to hear these um, these perspectives. And I think we have enough experience to, um, you know, again, working with Julie and 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 the folks in in Town Hall and and CPIC to give you some uh, really reasonable and effective options for dealing with that situation. How's that sound? Yeah. Great. I have a question. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of this plan is really dependent upon the availability of open space. So you can do more. Like obviously purpose open space that would right. will free things up. Right. So what if there is no open space in the village? What do you, what does this plan do next? I mean, here's my point. I keep seeing those illustrations of those nice buildings. I'm like that is not going to happen in this town. Kids, you're, you're basically misleading people when you show that illustration, I think. And, because it was basically on this corner. Now you've got a Roman Joe's there. You're not going to see all these nice two-story buildings with shingles and crazy lights and all this stuff. So it's just realistically, what can be done? You know, maybe say this is our. We can still do what we have to do. And then just put out a plan in terms of what else can happen. What is dependent upon this? I'm not. Get where I'm coming from on that. I kind of do, but I kind of don't because you started with a concern about open space. Well, I'm just saying, and I think that's that's. You mean uh, developable? It's, it's like the keystone, quite frankly. You know, if you don't have that, what do you have left to work on? There are some. If you I mean, my understanding is, you come over the bridge and you're in the lower village. There are some properties there that are not going to change for a long time, mm -hmm. either because they're totally new. Great ish or they're historic and they're very solid and then there are other buildings that are neither of historic value and they may not be around for a lot longer um i know all of us have seen areas of the country where there is a building on a site and then there is no building on that site and there's a lot of other development on the site. So you, I think that this code, I think, is is coming into play to think about future possibilities. It's not about, oh, this is only going to happen if there's an empty lot, because that there are lots there with buildings on them that may not be around in 15 or 20 years. But today's point, why write code today when we don't, we don't know what's going to happen there? Because you know, it takes more than you know one to tango. I mean, you've got to have a buyer and a seller. You need to have a developer and an interested property owner. You have all these little dominoes that have to line up for this to work. So let's just say, what is the realistic way to manage this thing without a building? You know, building a story that people think is going to happen in five years, as opposed to basically putting something in place that at least incrementally improves where we are now from a development perspective as well as giving the existing property owners maybe additional flexibility so that they can thrive. Does that make sense? Well, I think we already sort of talked about this. I mean, this is a very long-term plan. Mm -hmm. This is like 20, 30 years here. Um, I'll certainly still be here, knock on wood. That'll be fun. That's <laughs> encouraging. But it's, I mean, this is to guide that new future development. I mean, think about where Napa used to be, or, mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, 
here there used to be a what a gas station yeah and there used to be lots of lots of other things on this road that are no longer here because they got bulldozed and then well eminent domain built. is what happened yeah, here all right well it was, they were rebuilt <laughs> is my point so i'm just <laughs> yeah, they were here the next <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this guides that plan or the, that development in the future it doesn't impact necessarily like what um uh, leon's got to do tomorrow or even in five years for that matter um, how do you say that? Yeah. How do you say it doesn't affect well, what be, he's going to do right now? It'll affect that Thursday morning. Well, because he, he'd be grandfathered in as an existing non conforming use. So he wouldn't have to do anything over there. He'd just continue. But if he wants to do something, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So he does. It does change for him. But what I just heard from Kirk, we all just heard from Kirk, is that there are ways yeah. to handle that. And, and, and make and sure I, it hits every area then. Right. Not I mean, I think it's, it's not just going to be in one okay. zone. It's, it, it, will, it would, yeah, the whole top some center of zones, it will be in that 225.14, non-conforming blah, blah, blahs, and enlargements and things that can be done by existing... Yeah, you know, that's there now. Yes, yes, you can yeah, do yeah, so much yes, in an existing footprint. Yes, but in the top of center we, zones, we can change. make sure that that will. Yeah. But for happen. instance, let's say, you, let's use Brilliance. Um, let's we, say that he tore that we, down. We, and I think the way the present code is, if he tore that building down and he kept it and he wanted to put something back with the same footprint, he could. And he could increase it. 30%. That's the way I understand the code is presently. I think you have a two year time yeah, period. I think so. So that's already there, is what I'm saying. Maybe not to the degree, but, um, and we think when Leon goes that, but I'm pretty sure his son plans to take over. So it's going to be there long term. But is that still there in the new code? Yeah. I'm asking Julie. I don't think has the, the non-conforming section changed really? It hasn't, right? No. It wasn't our intention to significantly change it or make it more restrictive, Julie. I, I don't have a perfect recall about the comparison, but um yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's changed. The other thing's up actually a good point. If we rely on the zoning board of appeals, I don't think I can actually well Joe Trapton is on there, right? And sure. Becky, who's in Augusta most of the time, so I can't imagine that they're super in tune with what's going on here. Um, but if we're relying on the Zoning Board of Appeals as sort of the arbiter here, it might be important to pull them in like immediately. I know we've been, or you guys have been working with the Planning Board pretty extensively, but this is a group that you barely ever hear anything like, even less than the tree community. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it, it might be good to like kind of get them ready for the potential for depending on how we come up with the non-conforming uses um wording right Pull right absolutely it's a great idea i would love to know who the rest of them are I know, right? because they're not listed on yeah, the website. i was just looking they're not <laughs> no they're not. they change they leave and they come and they they've been a few years right <laughs> that, that, that's they're about to <laughs> they used to meet a lot but uh, now, we've for seen a while the in a lot. the early 90s they met we built a parking lot and it took everybody to learn <laughs> So no, those are the alien. Just alien one concern. thought about the idea of taking the crooker site out of the um, bargain here. I don't know, but my guess is that some of the developers would be very disappointed in that. Well, they have an interest in that. Of course, mm -hmm. that's what. But isn't that something that you are interested in? I am, but I'm not interested in making it more difficult for, for crookers in the existing business. I'm right. definitely right. against it. And it and sounds like what we need to do is, is work it both ways so that right. existing businesses can have the flexibility they need. And if they do decide to move, there's something they're in not place. Gonna move. I, I just really believe they're not going to move because okay. it's been expressed. But... I guess my thinking is, and I'm asking the question because I don't know if you can go back to leave that out. And then if you see it necessary and the developers want it in down the road later, this is a working document. So it doesn't have to be absolute this time to go to town meeting. 
And my recommendation was to completely take that up. The, the Crooker site. Yes, only the Crooker site at this point. Yeah. I'm more interested in hearing, you know, they could expand up to 50, 75 percent, whatever they don't, the don't come in at 10 percent because then I'm going to go to Ruth's side. But um, <laughs> just I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, yeah. if you come in with some foolish number, yeah, it'll, it'll just but I mean, I'm interested, but I want it all over the place, too. Yeah. Up and down the board. Yeah. So I have a series of other questions. Where are we with all of this? What, so what is the reason Liberty Circle is not in the annex zone? Liberty Circle, help me. <laughs> so the annex zone? Yeah. If you're, the way you're looking just to the left. Yeah. I think it was intended to be. Well, yeah. so this would be, wouldn't this be so um, all this is the school just right? just blue the playing fields. fields or is this playing fields kind of look like the, the navy has a friend of his up there yeah but this in the circles this would be oh. it was, it was, it was, it was the, the office oh, was the, oh yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah I'm, yeah can oh, yeah. here right yeah. It was so not intended to include the resource there, but it wasn't. Oh, what's the, so that should be part of that. Should be so so these are the existing the residences. Yeah. Libby Circle, this is before the Navy turned it over. Okay. All the buildings were raised. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's just an empty lot right here. Okay. Can, would it be helpful to bring this? Well, it is there. So we need to be able to, yeah. So Libby Circle's. Uh, right there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's up in, uh, it's uh, where uh, the word uh, annex is. Mm -hmm. It's up yeah, here. Right here. Exactly. Yeah. I want so, to say there were over 200 houses on Liberty Circle. And they've all been raised? Yeah. So that's interesting. I got to leave, but I just like to say take a drive if you don't know the areas because things like that are, that's a big, a big chunk of housing. Mm -hmm. I got to run. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it does include that, does it not? Can you go back to that satellite picture? Sure. Yeah, look at the satellite. <laughs> yeah, see, this is the street. I think this is Liberty Circle up here. Right in this area. And then this is the, yeah. Patriot this, Commons. Can you see? Yeah. So what she's Patriot saying. Commons is this. And this is Liberty Circle. Yeah. Maybe it's just bad dots on housing or something. Yeah, I, I, I don't have street lines. I don't have curb lines. And so if the, if the street, which up there, the street is not on its own lot, it doesn't show up very well. So that's why the buildings are still there. I will verify that though, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. Yeah, that was intended to be in there. And so you're saying it should be in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. if it's not, I mean, it could just be the building dots, but yeah. it looks to me like there's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talked about excluding that, but kept it in on purpose because we know there's a need for housing. That's yeah. um, with the schools right there. It's a perfect opportunity. It's, it, he's it, already, they're already throwing all the low income people out and converting all the apartments into condominiums, and there's nothing we can do about it. it there's, yeah. there's been a lot of time the last couple of years on the developers building all housing in there. Mm -hmm. It's gone back and forth. Presidium owns it. This income has been pulling back and forth out of the Brunswick. Oh. So, you know, there's there's a lot of interest there. Um, I've been evicting a lot of people as a book yeah. as well, oh, yeah. which really is pissing me off. I've actually called the lawyer about this. Oh, oh good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's yeah. nothing I can do. But just, it. it might be interesting to know, I mean, John Hodge came to the office hours and he he is all in favor of the way that form-based code takes the issue of density off the table. It allows a developer to build much more um, multifamily housing and density. Affordable. Affordable. Yeah, affordably. It's right. going to be right. Things. Yes, I am 100% affordable housing. People at work for medium incomes, a husband and wife with a couple of kids. There's no way they can afford a car or a house. 
we as people here can talk about it and try to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I feel very strong about that. And Ruth, you were talking before about being concerned that whether it's businesses, you know, developers, whoever, not having additional layers of approval process. Right. This doesn't give you anything additional. This is designed to streamline yeah. the process That's by great. creating mm -hmm. uh, clarity and offering options. So it's gonna be a, a process that I think is gonna streamline things for both the planning staff and the planning board. Um, yeah. And the developers. And the developers, that's right. Yes. Taking a lot of the uncertainty off the table. Uncertainty is where the clock ticks right. and the cost comes. There's so many costs into that one yep. unit. It's ridiculous and it's impacting the whole cost for people to be yep. able to live. And that's part of the intentions of this draft. Some of it's got to stop. We've got to get a hold of our representatives too. So are there more specifics? Because I, I you know, the, the impact. I, I don't know if Leslie and Kirk want to talk about, I hear from Roland the um, the question about why are we trying to regulate the future? Why not build on what's here, right? Just from a practical perspective, I'm just like you said, right. you know, I'm thinking what can we accomplish within 10 years? Right. It has an impact. And that's why, you know, can we put something into saying, you know, this is a high density district period. And you know something, something bold like that that you know really makes an impact on the ground. Well, I think I think this is bold, <laughs> and I think it's bold in the sense that it looks at where Thompson has already invested mm -hmm. in the infrastructure of water and sewer, and it says, okay, rather than invest further in that, let's let's look at this area and let's take the density issue off the table and allow for a different kind of development that will, over time, bring the town a more a, a stronger, more attractive sense of place and a more walkable series of areas, not just a, a town center, because we'll have a series of areas, right? And um, it's, some of that is already happening in Thompson Fair Mall too. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we're poor there. by any stretch, but we don't have another Mundra Hill area. You know, on a micro scale. But basically, you've got these apartment buildings being torn down for, you know, single family homes or duplexes or something like that. And say more. I mean, are you concerned that that not happen here? We want to make sure that doesn't well, happen. Here. I don't, you know, once those structures are built, I mean, look at Highland Green. Yeah. You've got these monstrous houses for two people. It's crazy. I mean, those footprints should, should be that big. Just in my opinion, I just think it's a waste of space. So, <clears throat> who knows? Well, form based codes will regulate that. Um, but I think it's being regulated types. by demand anyway. People, mm -hmm. the, all the stats, the future stats for housing mm -hmm. is much smaller mm -hmm. because it's going to be gone by the wayside, not really marketable. The way the trend is looking for the next 10 years. Um, I mean, and I, I see a, a range of size <laughs> it, in Highland Green. You know, some houses are large, some are. It's the recent ones have been really, really big. It seems to go against the trend. I thought they were going to build cottages and things like that, which seems a lot more appropriate. And given that this is not dealing with that. Yeah, I know. So, um, but you yeah. just don't want, you know, what's the rule change? Well, yeah. The reasoning for limiting everything in town to three stories seems to be stretching out sprawl. I think it's creating a more walkable. You walk better if a building is shorter. It creates a space where people want to be more than the six story, right. for example, or five story. A village. And it's keeping things relatively within the scale that we currently have. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are you advocating for? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many things. I don't think you're going to change my mind on a lot. I mean, this, I mean, right from the, the dictation of what you're doing on glass. No drive-throughs if it's going to be in the Crooker property, unless we've decided it's okay for pharmacies and banks, but we're not going to allow something else. Um, 
the the land grab that you must have public space and I, there's just way too much to overcome for me quite frankly but you've already given a few things those all of those things came up with the developers and they're all in play and they're all in conversation if you want to weigh in on those that would actually be helpful i, I know just, but but so do it in a way that we can actually take it down and sort of hear it and record it would that be all right i just did she hit me i'm recording okay thanks Dave. you're welcome <laughs> i mean it's it's there everything said well, here to make sure you'd like to have drive-throughs allowed for any business whatsoever is that what you'd like in the area of the mall i'm Absolutely. I think what you've done with a lot of this is you've taken the philosophy of the upper village here, yep. the upper main street, and you've pushed it down into the commercial district. And that's what I honestly believe has happened. In the Thompson Fair Mall. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe that's happened into the Crooker, Crooker Quadrant, if that's what's happening. I think you've put it so restricted. I, I, I just feel it's become so restrictive. I don't have an issue with the way we're set up today, with the way the mall is, the way it develops. We have entirely too much parking and that's our fault because we have these requirements that they must have certain square footage. The mall doesn't bother me. One I'm of not offended things... by McDonald's with a drive-through and, and what the pandemic showed us, drive-throughs are as important as anything. But where they get put is the issue here. They're gonna be put in the back. The developers have no problem. Only with that. if they're a pharmacy or a bank. That, that's in the Crooker. That's only in the Crooker district. But it, okay. But I'm, it's not in the Crops and Family. No, I understand that. I don't, I'm not in favor of the restrictions like that in Crooker when we're trying to redevelop that area. You know? So do you think the restrictions ought to be lifted completely? What do you think? I mean, give us what you think. I just told you, I think that those are too restrictive. Okay. And how much do we loosen that up? In, in your that I would allow a Dunkin', a McDonald's, uh, something to come in and have a drive through. Doesn't bother me. Um, and I don't care if gas pumps are out front of a building. Okay. Th that's how I feel. Right. So I, this, right. and, um, this is entirely too restrictive. What, what what you're to, to me what you're describing is uh, continuing on as things have always been, as opposed to trying to work toward a more livable uh, community, as exemplified by the common plan. I understand that, but let me explain. My life, my my community that I live in is at my home, my neighborhood. Yeah. When I get in to go to the mall. I go in my truck, I walk in the store and I leave. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking to hang out. I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm about. The mall is there for me to go to Hannaford. The mall is there for me to hit Rennie's and leave again. Mm -hmm. it, and I don't mind that. You want walkability, let's talk neighborhoods. Let's talk. I'm not worried about going to the mall. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to walk to Home Depot. It's not going to happen. I'm yeah. going to get him. I, I'm, I'm sorry. We, no, we do this all the time. We, we do this much. all the time <laughs> that we're worried about walkability to get to Home Depot. Mm. The sidewalks there, there's a whole lot of weeds growing out of them right now. Mm -hmm. So that tells me they're not getting you. I mean, so that I'm not opposed to vehicles, you know. There are going to be 80 units of housing in the tops and fair mall too. That's all happening before this code. Mm -hmm. Some of them, I can imagine, are going to, I mean, when I drive through Chops and Fair Mall Road, I'm amazed, as you are, that there are actually people walking and cycling and jogging. And it seems that there's a slight increase, like four years ago to today, there's an increase. People are more on And I'm fine with that, but I don't feel that you need to restrict a business yeah, they're, they're walking jogging you're saying it's happening now in the area with drive-throughs that we're all concerned the, about. the only thing about the way drive-throughs have been structured and leslie should it, be I'm given the, the floor quickers. for a second it's the yeah. i am on, i understand okay but to sit there and say drive-throughs are bad for walkability unless you're picking up a prescription in the crooker zone unless you're picking up a prescription or going to the bank because that's all that's allowed in this in the crooker zone I, how is that better for walkability? How is a bank transaction better than a coffee transaction for walkability? 
Leslie, jump on in. Sure, yeah. sure. I, I, have, I have so many responses to, that I wish I could say, um, and I don't think we have enough time, but um, first of all, the Thompson Fair Mall area, while upper village, all the villages are intended to be walkable, highly walkable, the code very clearly says that Thompson Fair Mall is intended to be both vehicular oriented and pedestrian oriented. And if you look at the um, suburban storefront building that we've defined, all that it does is, and this is a really common, you know, Starbucks picture, I think is in the code that shows that they, they orient it to the street so that somebody can walk up. If you look at the Panera Bread, is it a Panera Bread in the parking lot of the mall? It's mm -hmm. more walkable than any of the other buildings that are developed. And that's because that's the way that those um, fast food, fast food-ish places are moving. You can still drive and park but you can also walk between. Um, and just as a little note, I walk to Home Depot all the time. <laughs> so I, it's a mile from my house and I can walk and go and buy a plant or walk and go and get the screws that I need or whatever. I'm, you know, you can do that. And so the people that live in that area might want to do that. Well, you can still drive your truck to Home Depot. We're just trying to do both in that area to allow everybody to get there how they want to get there more comfortably and safely. Um, and then in terms of the Crooker site, you know, that was maybe a misunderstanding um, of the conversations that we were having at the time. Um, we had talked about allowing drive-throughs along 196 because that would be where it was accessed. But the more drive-throughs that you have, the stacking and people kind of going through it, especially for fast food, interrupts the pedestrian flow. After the developer meeting, we heard exactly that comment. And the developers all said to us, we're fine putting it on the back. We just want to be able to do it if we if we can. And so we are talking about changing that potentially for the Crooker site. The reason to allow it for pharmacies and banks is because you don't get a proliferation of those right next to each other, which makes walkability harder. You might have one bank that has a drive through or or two separated or, you know, one pharmacy, it, it just doesn't end up being like you would get all, you know, a Taco Bell, a McDonald's, uh, you know, everything all lined up right next to each other and everything is a drive through. That was the goal for the Crooker site. And that was part of because of the vision for the Crooker site. We were just trying to, you know, incorporate that desire for the Crooker site. So the section that's written in red that it won't be allowed is gone because that's what I was concerned about. That what was we for tonight. There's a, there's a highlight in red. It was a change. It'll be banks and pharmacies. What we're looking at is a draft now that the developers are. I understand. And that's all I have to work with. On. No, no, of course. And so that's but, why I'm giving you my the, comment. The revisions haven't been made yet, yep. but they're, Going oh, so that's... To, and so we're hearing that, we've, we've discussed that with the developers. I think what we still want to do is not have a stacking of fast food places one after the other, all with drive throughs because that, but but somehow to, to limit the density of those, the location of those, and that's possible, you know, with, but to allow more than what we've had and not to limit it to banks and pharmacies. It's all about a balance. Everything that we've talked about tonight is about a balance of you know one extreme to the other, and we're trying to figure out where we are um, in the middle there. And that's partially why we were talking to the developers. It's why we're going out for all of the public, you know, input is because we've got to make you know we've got to we've got a draft, but we we need uh -huh. to calibrate it. We need to move it back and forth, and it's going to move along that line if it, whether or not it's uh, you know how do we deal with nonconformities? How do we deal with drive-throughs or whatever, we need that input so that we can calibrate it further for Topson. Um, one thing that was discussed four, three or four years ago was the village and the walkable village. And now it's encompassed more. The walkable village makes a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense even from the full upper village, middle village, and lower village. That's always been a vision of the town of Topsland. And I think a lot of people bought into that and embraced it. 
but as we keep expanding it, I think now, for instance, small town, small cities, small towns, where they get they had we had meetings where they did um, crushed stone or sidewalks that were crushed stone, and walkable, and nice and pleasant, and uh, instead of spending all the money for sidewalks and things like that. And they said, uh, for instance, go drive around some of the back roads in Lewiston, which I did. And it's the way, it's a friendly thing. There's a business in the neighborhood. There's neighborhoods that are two stories. And so you go so many feet, that could be a store, that could be apartment buildings, but not high. And there's a sausage making plant, there's a uh, Italian bakery, that's what is a neighborhood. Right. And that's what right. brings the stuff in. It already exists. We just have to bring it here on this part of town to, I'm, I'm really opposed to the doing anything with purpose at this time. I think it's a working document and I think you can bring it in at any time, you know, in a couple of years or whatever. See where they're going to go and see what it's gonna be. And having said all those things, things further beyond Crooker, really, there's some very unsightly things on 196. And so we don't approach that. The other thing that needs to happen, if Crooker's things ever going to happen as a bigger development or more retail and more whatever, this road here, the bypass, needs to be expanded mm -hmm. to four lanes. It needs to be expanded now. We're not talking about those things. I'm just saying, these are all my visions and my thoughts and my, and as a select person and as a person that will always be active in the town, I see this, it was supposed to, it was laid out five years later, it was supposed to be four lanes. It never happened. And so we have to be on our legislature, our Senate, and as many people as we can. Why? I know it's affordability, but it's getting it's getting just like it was on Main Street, you know. So <clears> there's <throat> things like that we can do to improve the lower, middle, and upper village. And the upper it can go even up a ways on 196 to encompass it. But when you I agree with Dave, when you want to stop some things on that side of the road. I, I don't agree with it. I love the idea that housing is going in uh, in the mall where market basket. I think it's great people can walk there. And that's the whole idea of it. They can shop, they can do, and they can carry this stuff. I think that's great. So I fully support that stuff. Just don't support that. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so it sounds like some of that is going to be taken up or might be taken up in the next comprehensive plan. Yeah. Two years. Oh, by DOT. They're actually yeah. still banging right now. Yeah. Yeah. DOT. So, should we sort of bring this to a close? I'm not sure if there are more specific. Yeah. No, we're done. We're done. Just, we're done. I'm done. I'm out of questions. Yeah. yeah. Great. I wrote them. So, there's a lot for us to work on. Um, thank you. Um, we'll, we're going to be having a, a similar kind of event with the planning board. We'll see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. They've been working on all the cleanup stuff, so this is going to be new territory. Mm -hmm. So that will be on the agenda we go on. Yeah, okay. yeah, October third. Just in general, are you, and maybe it's current. Yeah, we talked two, three months talking about getting the non-conforming figured out. Thinking of your guys' schedule, it's probably like a two-month. Uh, time estimate to figure out. The non conforming by the, stuff. By the time you guys agree on it. I think it's going to be less than two months. Well, I'm prepared to jump in uh, immediately uh, in, in talking <laughs> with Julie and <laughs> Susan. <laughs> I, <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can waste any time if we want to stay on track here and uh, come back to you with some, uh, some reasonable alternatives. So, uh, you have a commitment from uh, from our side of the table, and I'm sure Susan and and uh, CPIC share. And Ju I know Julie's been really great. So uh, yeah, we'll jump in right away.
And I think as, as one of our closing comments, I think we ought to hear again from Julie that if form-based code had been in effect, Aroma Joes would look very different. And that's it. And it wouldn't be a dry. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> say there, there we go. It is not bad. All you need is 500 square foot so, brick building and a Thank drive. you guys. Oh, thank um, you guys. This is a thankless job. You. And you, you especially have been spending a ton of time on it. So. How can you call this? Appreciate you too much. <laughs> it's a great. It's been a lot of fun, and it still is. You know, we, we've got some twists and turns ahead, and we'll navigate them. That's what it is. It's hammering it out. Yeah, and the code certainly needs to be so it's understandable. Yeah. Somebody can go in. It's going to be a lot next, more user yeah. friendly. Right. A lot more a user lot. friendly. The whole thing, right, is I intended for that. Just remember, so the nice. sweet spot is the items that are the most requested, married with the ones that are actually achievable, probability wise, in terms of you know, how many hoops you have to jump through to make it happen versus something where, oh, well, we can make a code change and make it happen, for example, mm -hmm. versus having to like bring multiple stakeholders in and make it done in 20 years. You want here's something you run your website too. You put a countdown clock to the next comprehensive plan is being developed. That's not our job. That's the select board's job. They're going to appoint the next cost plan update committee or something else. But that's we have our focus. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Loud and clear. All right. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Good night. I think yeah, it's good.